well, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. This is really a, a massive crowd. Um, and uh, I'm very happy. Uh, last year, we, we launched this concept of uh, Café Scientifique, so it doesn't mean that we are going to, to have a coffee. It's, uh, it was based on the, the, those uh, principles, or those uh, meetings that happened a long time ago, you know, the, the Café Littéraire, where people would meet uh, and discuss about literature. So we are no, not going to talk about literature today, this is a Café Scientifique, and we launched this concept uh, last year, so it's the, the fourth instance, but it's the, the first time that we have uh, such a large crowd. So welcome everyone, not going to talk long, I just want to, to emphasize that the, the subject of this uh, Café Scientifique tonight is one of the one of the pillars of this uh, of this school, of our beloved school, it's uh, we often talk about, we do a lot about sports. Uh, we've recently joined the CIF League. We do a lot about, as you know, and you're actually sitting in, in it. We talk about a lot, a lot about theatres and performing arts, and a lot is happening in this uh, in this very place. And we talk a lot also about technology, uh, robotics, science, and that's one of our three pillars in this school. So I can see that there are many, uh, many parents, but also many students, and it's, uh, it's really uh, heartwarming. Uh, we have uh, grade 6 students, we have grade 12 students, and to see all these, uh, uh, and actually younger students, I've seen some primary students, and all these students gathered together uh, from primary to secondary up to grade 12, is really, really uh, reassuring for our, uh, for our future. So, uh, before anything, uh, I would like you, uh, to introduce you, or it's not really an introduction, but uh, uh, bring on the stage uh, Anton Ritsou, who's going to, uh, to present uh, uh, tonight uh, and this evening. And before we, we have uh, uh, the chance to meet with uh, Usama uh, Thank you for so, uh, welcome our fantastic guest, Usama Three years ago, uh, families at the VC decided to invest in technology. Thank you. Uh, I was a girl then to design three iLabs that we are using and trying to improve the capacities uh, and the skills of our students. And um, here we are. I'm going to show you uh, some uh, great examples. on a fait le cyborg et euh, j'étais avec que des garçons et ils voulaient tous faire des trucs hyper cool et tout et au final bah, c'est un peu moi qui tout fait et puis après on a fait on, cette année on fait des euh, eco abs donc euh, c'est des maisons écologiques et euh, voilà bah, là, on est en train de travailler dessus parce qu'on on doit les rendre demain et c'est pas fini encore Hi, I'm Max in the boat. And my go-to when I came to the Lycée was the Innovation Lab. The Innovation Lab where I learned robotsy. That was, my, that was my entry into the world of robotics. And because of the Innovation Lab, I've learned how to code many robots and build them. Autonomous, semi-autonomous, um, completely with a joystick. And it's even gotten me an internship at a company called Exobionics. Because of my experience in the lab, I was able to get in to get an internship where I was where I built a product for them. It was you know it was very fun, and all this was because I was part of the lab and I joined the lab in sixth grade and I haven't left it since. Hi, my name is Madeline Freeland and I'm in seventh grade. I have loved this lab since I came since the first time I came here. Uh, the first thing that we did was this project thing, uh, that. We had to make like a wind moving car or a wind moving machine and that's when I first realized that I really like this and that I want to continue doing this. And, and thanks to this, the material in the lab, we were able to make even more fun projects like 3D printed rings and laser cut animals that could hold our uh, utensils and school supplies. And 
the lab has always been really fun and we always learn new exciting things like last week we learned how to start like, using python and how to ask questions and having answers to them and i think that this is what i want to do when i'm older hello my name is scott hickman and i'm passionate about new technologies at a very young age i built my own website I then made various machines using Lego Mindstorms and XC. When I entered middle school, I joined the Innovation Lab. I worked on robotic projects and uh, learned the programming language Robot C, as well as Python, JavaScript, and Java. Then I learned about AI. I like this field so much that I want to work in artificial intelligence when I grow up. The Innovation Lab allowed me to pursue my passion in new technologies to make our school a better place. I'm Camila Fascinelli. I'm currently in Technovation and I love the iLab. I think it was the school's best investment and with that we were able to do so many different projects such as the Greenhouse Project that made uh, us be able to do like these echo houses and it was super interesting. That's actually where I get my passion for all the technological stuff and that's what actually inspired me to do uh, Technovation. So let's go iLab. Hey, so I'm Ian, and so back in the seventh grade, we had a project where we had to design an echo lodge, and so that project really inspired me to pursue um, engineering and also architecture. And so following that, with Mr. Ritsu, he gave me the opportunity to help um, to design this maker lab. And so I did that, and then I did some internships afterwards. And so that really, I found my passion through this. And so this um, next year, I'm going to be attending Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I'm going to be studying architectural engineering there and continuing my passion of solving problems, as well as designing new buildings and making everyone safe. So hi guys, so here's my aquaponic system. And so an aquaponic fit system uses the waste of the fish uh, to make the plants grow faster. And so in our system, we actually use a bioreactor right here, and you can see inside and uh, to enable the bacteria to develop more and be able to transform the um, fish into nutrients for the plants. Our system is also designed to go off-grid, so during the day, instead of keeping the system indoors, to enable the plants to have the maximum amount of sunlight, uh, you could actually bring the system outside and run it on battery power with the battery right here and the solar panel. And so if you come up close, you can see inside, uh, we have all the electronics, so that looks pretty cool. Also, this project was designed using Fusion 360. In a few weeks, we will add the plants and the fish to start the first uh, growing season of our aquaponics system. You got to see my uh, mosquitoes. Um, so, what I want is to, it's to support them and to, to be with them uh, and take them as, as far as I can with the success. And uh, this is one of the reasons I, I, I was brave enough to, to write Monsieur Cathy. Uh, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur Cathy received uh, his PhD from Super Aero Toulouse, France, in 1980. And he also went to a French school in Syria. That explains a lot. <clears throat> Some of you may know that I'm scuba diving when I, uh, I'm trying to help with marine uh, conservancy. And uh, besides helping the ocean, is the only silent retreat I find to escape uh, Jules, uh, who literally live in an island. Uh, yeah, you guys are, are lucky because you have teenager for a bit of your life, but for me it's going to be forever. Uh, uh, Mr. Katib is Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Robotics Laboratory at Stanford University. After a long, very long list of awards and robot miracles, uh, Usama was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2018. Uh, when, I, when I saw his uh, mermaid-like uh, robot uh, in the Red Sea diving and, and uh, studying the, the coral and at, at a deepness that I could, I could not go and work, uh, I was like, damn, I wish I was like, I grew up in this school and with uh, my amazing colleague teacher, like get to learn with them and have a chance to work with that one day. 
so for me it's too late. But for my musketeers, uh, it's still a possibility. And it's why I want them to be inspired by, by, by men like him. Uh, uh, when I said I'm going to write to him, they, they say no, there's no chance. This guy is touring the world, he's, he's very busy, and I said I'm going to try anyway. And, uh, and then, because there's three things I like to teach them. They're going to learn much more than I ever dream of. But there's three little things maybe I can give them. Uh, one is try to use technology to, to save uh, uh, to, to, to fix the mess we did with nature. Uh, that's number one. Two, uh, to have as, as compassion for a living being around us. And three, there is one thing. It's that the most celebrated scientists have something in common. It's humility. And I knew it when I, when I saw the, the image of, of uh, Usama Khatib. I knew he was an indicator. And it will be a chance he will, he will answer me. And a few days later, I received uh, greetings from Paris. Thank you for all the kind words. I'm, uh, of course, happy to speak at the Lycée Français of San Francisco. I already deeply respect him, and uh, for sure, is uh, one of the most celebrated scientists, Oussama Makati. Thank you for your generos generosity and being here with us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici. Uh, je ne je, je pouvais pas manquer cette occasion de, de vous rencontrer et aussi de, de voir tous les étudiants du futur à Stanford qui travailleront peut-être en AI. J'en ai vu plusieurs. Euh, malheureusement, je, je vais tourner en anglais quand je fais la présentation, mais, mais vraiment, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici euh, ce soir. J'ai euh, vraiment euh, euh, beaucoup d'engagement. De, de, Aujourd'hui, on était euh, à Stanford avec euh, 135 nouveaux PhD euh, students euh, in computer science. Et toute la journée, on était euh, avec eux à présenter, à, à discuter, euh, à, à leur montrer ce qu'on fait comme, comme recherche. Et, et voilà une soirée magnifique avec vous euh, pour continuer cette discussion. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment un plaisir. Merci de, de m'avoir invité. Et, et donc, euh, on va commencer avec euh, le concept de... Euh, Haptic Interaction. Donc, il y a euh, ici Gérald. Gérald, c'est un... C'est docteur Gérald, parce qu'il vient de, de faire... Euh, de terminer son PhD et maintenant, il est en train de faire un postdoc avec nous. Donc, euh, Gérald, c'est le pilote de notre robot, euh, notre robot Ocean One. Et, et avant de commencer, moi, je, je voulais proposer de, de faire un un dive virtuel. Est-ce qu'on peut faire ça? Okay, so uh, now we take our robot, we make a model of the robot, we put this model in the water, we use the model to create a controller, and uh, here is the robot floating in the water. This is a simulated water. Uh, Gerald is going to close the hands, Close the hands, please. Open the hands. Can you go up? Can you go down? So when, what the general is doing is attaching each of the haptic devices to the blue hands and just guiding the hands. And the robot is following those hands. So now we can turn left. We can turn right. We can, we can do a lot of things, but let's go and look for the treasure. <laughs> All right, let's, let's find this treasure. Where is it? So normally we do this in 3D. Uh, that is, uh, Gerald will have a, a, a stereo vision and is able to see in 3D where you can see the depth. But uh, unfortunately on the screen he's going just to see 2D and it's going to be difficult, so I'm going to press 2 here for you to change the view so now he can look at the camera that is locating the hand and come closer be careful be careful this is this is dangerous a little more turn a little bit 
Yes. Okay, let's pick it up. Let's, let's lift it up. Uh, don't drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. <laughs> Ooh! Could you push it a little bit? So, what is difficult about this task is the fact that there is contact, and we need to simulate contact in real time in order to interact with it. So, we developed a lot of algorithms that can solve those problems in the real time. And these algorithms are uh, even best than what you see in, in the movies. Uh, these are really amazing algorithms that treat all these problems in real time. So, uh, l let's do one more thing. Uh, how about going to the corals? So, just uh, behind this boat, there, there are some corals, and we need to we need the, to uh, place sensors, collect samples. So Gerald is going to go there and try to take a sample. So usually when we take a sample, we place it in a container. You see this container on the left. And uh, I'm going to help you with the camera. Sorry. Yeah. So you have to come lower. So w once we take a sample, we we uh, place it in the container, we close the container, and then the container goes to the surface on its own. Yeah, this is very difficult because uh, it is 2D and he has to come closer, closer without pushing it, and close. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so now we're going to the container. And if you want, I can, I can give it to you. All right, you, got, you place uh, the sample there. And back a little bit. Yeah, just, that's fine. To the left, to the left, yeah. There is a lot of water inside. <laughs> wow, close it, close it, it will push it down. It's going to fall. It is full of uh, sand. <laughs> wow. Uh, Gerald, bravo. <laughs> so, uh, what we, what we saw, can we switch please uh, to the other slide? What we saw is just an example of what we are going to do in the water, in, in uh, off the coast of Toulon, on uh, La Lune, uh, the vessel of uh, King Louis XIV that uh, was, uh, this vessel sunk, sunk actually on 1664. And uh, it's amazing because it was not found until 1993. So the vessel was sitting there and not found. It was about 20 miles from uh, the coast. But the reason is the, the vessel uh, is very deep. It's beyond where divers are able to go. Any diver here? OK, so how deep you can dive? 20? 30 meters? Ah, I mean, typically you can go up to 40 meters maybe, but beyond that it becomes really difficult. And uh, 100 meters is not possible. So what, whatever we do with our robots today uh, would allow us to uh, basically see. But we cannot do, we cannot retrieve, we cannot uh, uh, find objects and uh, put them somewhere or take samples. So the way we would going to be able to do anything like this for where uh, basically you're touching gently uh, an object and removing that object and uh, and feeling what uh, the stiffness or characteristics of the object so ocean one was designed precisely to bring this capability ocean one was designed to create an environment where a uh, human can interact uh, with a robot and virtually dive in the water. 
So the thing about this robot is it's not only a robot that can uh, allow you to reach an area, but when this robot is going to touch the seabed, you will feel it in your hands using this device. So you're going to be able to feel the, the contact, the object, and you can guide even the robot when the robot is in trouble. So this is the concept that we just saw. Uh, Gerald is again here, but now with more sophisticated haptic devices. These are the haptic devices that we used in the actual mission. And uh, in a way, if you think about it, when you are moving and touching an object, this force sensor on the robot is sending the information back to the haptic device, and the haptic device is going to be able to uh, reproduce that by pushing against you. So in this room, there is only one person who tried it, but uh, after, at the end of uh, the presentation, you are most welcome to try it and feel how this works. It is quite amazing. Now, the thing also is because we are able to connect remotely, this robot is going to interact with a very complex environment sometimes, and we can ask for help from other stations. Maybe we have an expert in Australia that needs to check what is going on, and then we can uh, bring expert uh, uh, intervention remotely. The other, uh, the other slide that is going to come, <laughs> hopefully, something turned off over there. Okay, thank you. Uh, the communication. The communication is going to uh, be a big challenge because uh, in the water, signal doesn't travel well. So we use a relay station that provides power and communication through flashing light to the different robots involved. And that allows us to communicate very quickly and be able to feel what the robot is doing. Now, good luck building a robot like this. It is really a big challenge. I mean, it is one of the most complex, sophisticated machine with all the sensors. So we had collaboration with the RASM. It's uh, uh, the, the agency in France that is uh, working on um, underwater archaeology. But their advice was to explain to us the requirement for the mission. Uh, but uh, building the robot itself took us almost three and a half years. And here are my students in the lab working on that uh, construction. Uh, it is quite challenging uh, to think about a robot that we can build in a laboratory of a university can really go to the field and succeed and do all the, those things. And that was what quite, was quite amazing. Uh, at the same time, this robot cannot be operated in the air. It's like space robots. So you need to take the robot to the pool in order to make it float and then the arms can operate. So we have pool at Stanford, we pull the robot. There is a special ramp on which we lower the robot and then now the robot is happily floating in the water. And then the robot is going to be able to uh, move, but we discover a problem, we take it back and forth, and finally, three and a half ye years later, using, uh, as you can see, the haptic devices, uh, the robot was imitating a dolphin uh, <laughs> gait. <laughs> and, and we were able to, to get the robot ready for this archaeology mission. So, all this work is not about just archaeology, not about just the environment, but every aspect of things that you can imagine in the 72% of the surface of the planet uh, is below 40 meters. And we have to, to think about ways of reaching, dealing with those challenges. So think about just offshore platforms and all the accidents we have if we do not maintain well those uh, places. So uh, there are so many applications that are similar. That is applications where we connect the human and the machine. Think about underground mining. 
In mining, uh, there are so many accidents every year. That, uh, I don't know how many accidents in South Africa, in, in China, in uh, Chile. And uh, uh, this is me <laughs> in, in, in Peru. And what you see on the left is a gold mine. And this gold mine on the left uh, is, you have a vein, uh, this orange part, and it goes in the mountain. So, in order to remove the gold, what we do is we remove large part of the space and then we treat it uh, uh, because we, we, we have to extract the gold from it and it, it, that adds a lot of chemicals and uh, a lot of danger to the environment. So, I guess we found uh, how to fund our research. You go to the gold mine, you in the gold, <laughs> and, then, and then you can fund the research. Uh, think about all the environment, like uh, this is from Fukushima radiation. How can we go there? We cannot send human, but we can send robots. But the problem is it's very difficult for the robots to navigate all those environments, and the only way to do it is to connect the human back. And this is the idea, the cooperation, collaboration between the human and the machine. And this is found everywhere, in services, in logistics, in, in uh, uh, domestic environment, in uh, human augmentation. We, we can build exoskeletal system that can support human uh, doing hard work, uh, carrying heavy loads, or uh, supporting an injured to recover while recovering, and all of these things. This is one of the first uh, exoskeletal system, electrical system that was developed uh, in Japan, and uh, uh, it was uh, a one step. I mean, today we have so many wearables, we call them, uh, in robotics. So there is another aspect about robotic, and this is the uh, cognitive interaction. The idea that we can communicate and understand uh, the intention of the human, and all of that brings all kind of social interactions with the robot. So collaborative robotics is really the future of what we want to do in robotics, and that is bringing a lot of challenges in terms of how we create this connection between human and machine. Oh, this is another example from uh, Boeing, where uh, we have to find small people who can do the riveting uh, in those wings, because the space is very confined and difficult. So, what we are talking about is really similar to what we do in surgery with robots. We want to be able to have the expert, we want the interface to a machine that is doing the operation we, without too much pain because we can do uh, 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 minimally invasive surgeries. Uh, we are going to do surgery underwater, underground, and connect the expert to the machine. So this is Ashimo, and uh, if you came to Stanford a few years ago, Ashimo was at Stanford with us for almost 10 years. Ashimo is an amazing machine that jumps and runs but uh, it was at Stanford to learn how to do those kind of uh, useful tasks. So, physical interaction, carrying objects and placing them is really hard and challenging. If you think about this problem all, and you see it, you have to ask yourself how much programming goes into it. They spend a lot of time programming every motion of the robot. And the question is, how come, how come we, can, we are still using the same technique we use in manufacturing? Because this idea of programming every aspect of the motion, we did it in manufacturing and it works very well, but there we are using all kind of jigs and structure to make it work. In those environment, that doesn't work anymore. We cannot pre-program the robot. So the only way to think about it is to think about how human do it. How a little child is able to open the bottle without any difficulty. And that brings all kind of studies around the idea of how we can acquire skills. And to acquire skills, we need to look at human and try to understand the human. And this is something that you can do by observing human, measuring the different uh, effort the human is performing and creating 
a different kind of manipulation using those skills. But in this picture, you see something very different. On the left, you see really heavy and rigid robot. Well, today we are in a revolution to change all of that. Before, we needed to know the trajectories, so we needed to be precise, and we needed heavy, rigid, bulky robot that can move fast, but we isolate them, we put them in cages. Now we want to move in the real world, we need a different kind of robotics. And this is what we call compliant robots, robots that are soft, robots that can interact safely with humans. And this is what is taking us to automation 4.0, the fourth generation of automation. So, just an example of how this works. The idea, instead of programming a trajectory to go to the goal of placing an object on top of another, we are using the contact forces from anywhere, the contact forces guide the motion. So, the reaction forces on the robot tells the robot how to move. No trajectories. It is a skill that every one of you perform every day when you place a cup of uh, coffee, but you, we don't think about it. But when you discover what you're doing, you have this possibility of feeling your way, placing, making the contact, and moving in the proper direction wherever you start. So, so, I'm going to skip this because uh, we, 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 we don't want to uh, see the whole uh, details, but uh, essentially the world can move and you're still able to maintain the contact. And uh, a study of this problem, so now we, we close your eyes, we, we, we measure the forces and we let the, the subject perform this task over and over. And what we find is there is something that is related to the geometry, to the compliance, to the contact forces, and now we can use it to teach the robot all kind of new things. So the robot here is learning how to uh, put the cap on the bottle, but it doesn't matter the size of the bottle, the orientation of it, and uh, now we, we teach the robot how to, to put a big pot lid, and uh, from one uh, example to the next, we are generalizing over a wide space of applications. Now we take this further. So one thing about human is we have two arms. And if you think about most of the tasks we do, I mean, just imagine you put one hand behind your back and try to do things in the world. It's very difficult. So we. We want to be able to use two arms and two hands, and when we are using two hands, that simplifies. When they yeah, merci. Uh, so. Elena is teaching the robot uh, dynamic skills and uh, launching this for the robot to catch. Well, this is not easy, but, but this is uh, the, the real things that we can do once we have two hands and once, once we understand what human uh, is actually doing, predict the human. So we need to model the human intention. We need to model the human musculoskeletal system. We need to model the human uh, skills. And for that, what we do is we go to modeling the musculoskeletal system and create a, a reconstruction of the motion. This is remarkable also because we are able to do this in real time. So if we do it in real time, we can do a lot of things. We can, we can uh, measure all those effort and uh, uh, capacity of the muscles, and then we can help the human do better. So, I don't know, uh, do we have any golfer here? Anyone is playing golf? <laughs> up, up there, okay. Do you need any help? Uh, because, because we know the secret. I mean, now, uh, if you're playing tennis, if you're playing uh, ping pong, uh, we know the secret in, in those motions. First of all, you need to fit it to your own physiology, and we can give you your own atlas, and now you can 
just wear these sleeves, uh, tactile sleeves, and they give you directions and corrections of your motion, and you will be able to improve much and, and uh, be a, a pro. The other thing is, is when we are studying those things, we, we need to think about making contact not only with one point, but with the whole body of the robot, as the robot is interacting, immersed in that environment. So, so all of that makes it really, very really challenging. I mean, you have to think, humans are amazing. I mean, when you study uh, those problems, you realize how amazing our hand is, how amazing our capability to coordinate uh, is. And, and in here, you need to control the posture, you need to control the task, you need to control the contact, you need to control uh, the, the constraints, so many constraints on the robot, you need to balance how we do it. How human manage to do it? Well, we discover actually human are really, really smart at this. I'm, I'm forgetting about everything. I'm just going to focus on my hand reaching. Suddenly my shoulder feels that my hand is extended and I need to move my body. I control the posture separately but in coordination with the task. We, we studied this problem and we came up with an algorithm that allowed us to implement this as a whole body controller. Now, with a whole body controller, we were able to implement things that even human would have difficulty to do, uh, such as imagine uh, you are making contact with the slippery surfaces and you, you, man you have to maintain normal contact, otherwise you will fall. And to do that, you have to maintain all these reaction forces inside those what uh, these uh, friction cones we call them this is remarkable in the ability of the robot to adapt to sense to feel and control all its interaction with the environment uh, this is was implemented to, uh, on ashimo in fact ashimo when you go to a show of ashimo they tell you there is one rule with ashimo don't touch it if you touch the robot you interrupt the trajectory and the robot would fall. So you can see we, we, we broke the rule and now the robot is being guided by the human for the first time because the robot is feeling. You can, you can actually notice that Ashimo is himself is surprised. What is happening? What's going on? Why am I moving? So, now you can take this one step further and you can make your robot climb. I mean, robots like to climb. And, and now you can see the robot climbing. So we, what we are doing is we are adding a gate of climbing to the contact. Another problem in robotics is most of those robots are moving indoor. Imagine taking your biped robot to a rocky terrain. I mean, it's going to fall. But if we think how humans do it, we can get the robot to balance, uh, balance using uh, uh, special uh, tools that would feel the contact and extend the support area. So for those of uh, the students who are interested in robotics, from any aspect you would like to come to robotics, you can come to it, because robotics is very broad, it brings uh, many different problems from design to material to sensing to control to planning, reasoning, haptics, uh, uh, ethical issues, all of these things and the interaction with human that takes place from the interface to the system where we are able to connect input, uh, speech, uh, uh, haptic in uh, input uh, to the robot to execute tasks in an autonomous machine that is running all these capabilities. So all of this went to Ocean One. When we look at Ocean One, don't look at it as just one uh, hardware machine. It, it is all the smart uh, capabilities that the machine acquired, all the uh, algorithms that were implemented to allow this robot to uh, move and interact in the environment. So one day, I remember, still remember, it was a Tuesday in March. It was in March and the robot, everything was working. I said, tomorrow we're not going to uh, the pool again. We take, took the robot, put it in a box, and ship it to Marseille. And here is the robot 
going to reach the Landre Malraux, uh, which is the sh sh uh, vessel, uh, uh, scientific vessel of archaeology. And here is the robot landing. <laughs> so now imagine our robot went to the pool, one meter diving. Now we are going to 100 meter. Everyone was scared. We were scared. Uh, uh, Gerald was walking by the boat for like everyone. We didn't know what's going to happen. So we, we said, if we send the robot immediately to 100 meter and something goes wrong, we lost it. So we have to do something with a diver. So we send the robot to only uh, 15 meters. And uh, you can see the robot diving here at 15 meter with uh, uh, a diver who uh, was actually an archaeologist. Uh, this is Olivia. She uh, worked with the robot uh, to check every aspect of the robot, uh, that the robot is working uh, well. You can see uh, the Olivia from the eyes of the robot. And she certified the robot. The robot is fine. So the, we went all the way down to uh, 100 meters. These are two cannons still standing on La Lune. And uh, the robot went without any problem. We were checking every 10 meters, everything, no problems, no leak, no pressure, uh, difficulty. And one thing we forgot, as the robot came closer and closer to the seabed, with those thrusters turning, all the sediments started to come in front of the cameras and we lost visibility. We couldn't see anymore what was uh, going on. And you will see it in the video, the robot got caught between the two cannon. And it was midnight, and the captain was saying, Osama, we have to leave, uh, the, the sea is getting dangerous. And like we were all, no way, we're not leaving the robot there. No one can bring. And, and believe me, so we started pulling with the thrusters back. We wanted to pull the robot, and the robot was like completely stuck. My God, I mean, what can we do? And then you realize this robot has arms and it's stuck on La Lune, but you can walk on La Lune because you can push your way with the haptic device. And we started pushing with the haptic against the walls and the robot jumped and I was so happy. <laughs> It was, it was really, really scary. I mean, it was one of the scariest things. We thought we lost the robot. The day after, we couldn't go. The next day, the boat had a problem. And on Friday, the 15th of April, we were uh, back there at 5 in the morning. And very quickly, we, I mean, we, we were trained now. We knew what to do. And we went down to 100 meters. We, we found the base. We placed it in the container. And uh, the, the base came to the surface on its own. The, this is what we saw in the, uh, in the same uh, uh, simulation that we did, so we had the training for that. And now everyone wanted to touch this face, especially the archaeologists. They, they were really surprised. This is my colleague, Michel Lour, uh, who's uh, the director of archaeology, underwater archaeology. And he was so happy because we didn't scratch the, the face. The face came exactly as it was. And, and in fact, like every time, because they experience every time they go and try to take anything, it is smashed, it is, it is destroyed. Uh, this is Olivia here, and she's looking at this. She said, oh, that is, that is a Catalan base. It has four ears. And if you look closely, you can see the history of, of centuries of the sea written on it. It's really amazing. And uh, uh, we, we were, we were uh, so excited, we, but it was, it was uh, not announced, I mean, it was a secret mission until uh, we had uh, the press conference in uh, Marseille two weeks later. The year after, we went to uh, Santorini, and uh, we went to, to uh, a volcano called the Colombo Volcano. The robot was there uh, interacting with uh, divers and assisting them in measurement and sampling uh, underwater. But I'm, I'm going to show you uh, this uh, video of Ocean One. It's only a two and a half minute videos, but you will see uh, all the major steps in that mission. So 
deploying the robot is quite difficult because you need uh, a crane, you need also divers to uh, unlock uh, the connections, and uh, uh, here are the divers. But once in the water, this robot is uh, swimming like a fish. It is floating, and now the robot is able to lower the meters uh, the robot is moving uh, and performing all the tasks with uh, Olivia and uh, uh, everything seems to work there was no major problem here so we were uh, checking also these grippers I mean you see these hands these hands were designed specially for wrapping around any type of object and you can see the hands holding uh, the object with all the... So Olivia is telling the robot, you're ready, you can do it. And now we are about to go to 100 meters. Uh, this is the control room. It's very dark, so we place light uh, and uh, uh, cameras down there. You start to see the uh, seabed, and you can see the cannon standing on the island. So you, you can see uh, how the sediment started to come, and as we maneuvered between the two cannons, uh, we had uh, this loss of vision, and we the robot was blind here and, and the robot gets stuck completely so look at Hannah uh, Hannah my student was oh my god what are we going to do <laughs> and and gently we started pushing against the, the cannon and the walls and the, the robot started to free itself it was rescued. <laughs> so on the Friday uh, uh, of April 15th, we were back and uh, we found uh, the base that we brought uh, to the surface. So here we are about to take uh, the, the base. Uh, it was very slippery. I, I, every time I hold it, like the hands would come out. So we, we had to turn it and then place the hands inside and then take it. And uh, the other uh, hand is holding it uh, to stabilize it. So now we're going to place it in the container. So in the container now. So he's asking me to close the container and that is the end of the mission because the container will come to the surface. <laughs> Everyone was really finally we have it, we have it, and uh, uh, it was it was just an incredible thing. Everyone wanted to touch it. I managed to touch it first, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, the students. So finally, it was a big celebration with champagne for everyone, including the robot. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, as I said, we didn't uh, uh, announce it until uh, two weeks later. Uh, two weeks later uh, in Marseille, uh, uh, au Musée de la Mer, uh, but thousands of uh, Marseillais wanted to see the robot. And uh, we, we decided, well, we're going to leave the robot at the museum. Uh, the robot was staying at the museum. You can see the uh, all the uh, uh, media, uh, uh, television, and uh, uh, interviews with the radios. Everyone in France was really excited about this. So the robot stayed there for for weeks before returning to Stanford. Now uh, this robot uh, that we have today can go to 200 meters. And one of the challenges we have now in the coming expedition is to go to much deeper. So we are redesigning the robot to go to, go to 1,000 meters. 1,000 meters, uh, basically, 
if you think about it, it's because of the pressure. The volume is fine, it can go to 1,000 meter, meters if we can keep the, the volume, but because of the pressure, that uh, foam will, will collapse. And, and the only way to deal with it is to add material uh, density. But then your robot will become bulky because you have more weight and you need more volume. But we were able to find a new material. In fact, in France right now, we are fabricating that material for the robot uh, to go deeper without having that weight. And here is the new uh, version of the robot that will be ready this summer. And then we are going to take the robot to a shipwreck in Corsica. Uh, in this shipwreck has oil lamps, beautiful oil lamps. I saw we, were, we went uh, last uh, summer and no one is able to get to them because every time they try to catch one, they break it. And, and like the archaeologists cry, I mean, no, don't do it, don't touch them. So they are waiting for Ocean One to go there and bring those lamps. The other mission uh, that we have is uh, to take the robot to uh, the highest lake in the world, Titicaca Lake in Peru. And uh, there is a, a ship uh, uh, wreck of a steamboat that sunk there uh, in uh, the 18th century that we are trying to locate exactly and then we will be sending the robot as well. So, uh, this is one, just one tiny step in a long, long, long journey of development that hopefully will take us to develop and build capabilities that will allow us to explore water without having uh, to place humans in dangerous situations. In the same thing underground and in the air or in space. Thank you very much for your attention.